Babylon life. That's what I'm titling this series uh, in the book of Daniel. If you haven't already opened your Bibles, open them to the book of Daniel. We're uh, going to be just looking at the first seven verses of Daniel. Uh, we'll also be in Jeremiah. So as soon as you get one finger in Daniel, you, <laughs> you can also turn to Jeremiah 25. Um, I'm excited to, to, to look at the life of Daniel. Of course, the, the book is filled with stories, uh, great stories. These are flannel graph stories, Sunday school stories. They're, they're like the epic kind of classic. Veggie Tales has made, you know, uh, stories about this, these different stories. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of, of that part in the early chapters, but then there's prophecy. Uh, there's so much prophecy in Daniel. Uh, and, and really, I think Daniel holds the key to understanding uh, things in the end times. And so I'll be excited as we get to that. We have several weeks before we'll get into some of that or the bulk of that. But, but uh, I'm excited to begin this new study. In Psalm 137... Verses 1 through 4, the, the psalmist writes about the captivity in just emotional kind of emotion evoking terms. The psalmist writes, by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung our harps. For there our captors demanded of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? I think the psalmist captures the heartache of this time in the life of God's people and the challenge that he articulates there is how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? I think that's the question. I think that's the question that's before us today. How can we not just sing, but really it's a, it's a picture of how can we live? How can we exist? How can we worship how can we follow the Lord in the midst of, for them it was captivity, for us? It's not a whole lot different. We live in a foreign land. I'm telling you, you need to get your mind around that. We live in a foreign land. As, as wonderful as this country is, as much as we love it, as patriotic as we might be, we always need to remember this is not our home. And so the lessons, the lessons of Daniel and Daniel's buddies, they're important lessons for us today. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? We're going to just begin to look at it today. Next week, we'll, we'll see really the second part of this, this chapter. We're just going to look at the first uh, seven verses. But there's great lessons for the church, great lessons for all of us, application for, for how to live by faith in the midst of captivity. Let me read these uh, first seven verses here. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the, king, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. 
and he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and he appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. And to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. As we look at these verses, we're, we're going to look at this whole idea of, ca- of captivity. I mean, that's, the, that's, the, you know, that's where they're at. Israel has been taken captive. And so we're going to be looking at it in three ways. First, we're going to look at the cause of captivity. Second, we're going to look at the cost of captivity. And then third, we'll be looking at the control, the control of captivity. The cause of captivity was sin. The prophet Jeremiah, he he prophesied to the nation. He spoke to the nation for 23 years. Calling the nation to repentance. Year in and year out, day in and day out. Calling them to repentance, but they refused. They refused, refused to heed the message of the prophet, the word of God. Actually, they wanted to kill him. God said, okay. I'm going to send Nebuchadnezzar. And you're going to be taken captive for 70 years. Turn to Jeremiah 25. I want to look at just verses 4 through 12, Jeremiah 25. It says, And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, again and again. But you've not listened, nor inclined your ear to hear, saying, Turn now everyone from his evil way and from the evil of your deeds, and dwell in the land which the Lord has given you and your forefathers forever and ever. And do not go after other gods to serve them and to worship them. And do not provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. And I will do you no harm. Yet you have not listened to me, declares the Lord. In order that you might provoke me to anger and with the work of your hands to your own harm. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all these nations round about, and I will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and a hissing and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of joy, And the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones, and the light of the lamp. This whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. (sighs) Again, Jeremiah prophesied over and over and over again, and this had gone on for years. It wasn't just Jeremiah. The prophets were always calling the nation to repentance. And clearly, God says, listen, if you repent, I'll I'll relent. It's it's like he's the loving heavenly father. He doesn't want to do this, but he does because they don't. They do not repent. They refuse him over and over and over again. Why? Why 70 years? Why 70 years? Maybe you know the answer to this. Clearly, clearly their sin was, you know, it was a mixed bag. They were involved in idolatry. 
But then there was a specific sin that, that, that caused God to want to bring them to captivity for 70 years. He had commanded the nation to observe the Sabbath. Not just the weekly Sabbath, but the annual, this, this Sabbath every seven years. The nation was to let the land lie fallow. And they didn't do this. For hundreds of years, they ignored the Lord. It, it, it's an interesting thing how God, what he told them to do was, listen, you, you work the land for six years. And in that time, you store up for the seventh year. And don't work the land during that seventh year. It's all about trust, right? It's all, God knows what's best. It, and so he gives this, this law, this ordinance for a reason. This is good for the land. It's also good for the people because they learn to trust him. I said, no, not going to do that. This is, what, this is what it says, Exodus 23, 10 through 12. It says, you shall sow your land for six years and gather in its yield, but on the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, so that the needy of your people may eat, and whatever they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. You are to do the same with your vineyard on your olive grove. Six days you are to do your work, but on the seventh day you shall cease from labor, so that your ox and your donkey may rest. And the son of your female slave, as well as your str the stranger, may refresh themselves. There's great purpose in these things that God tells them to do. But this is part of the law. This is part of his command to them. You're supposed to do this. They ignored him. In Leviticus 26, 33, it says, You, however, I will scatter among the nations and will draw out a sword after you. As your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste, then the land will enjoy its Sabbaths all the days of the desolation while you are in your enemy's land. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation uh, will observe the rest which it did not observe on your Sabbaths while you were living on it. I think sometimes... Sometimes we, like Israel, evidently, we think somehow uh, what we've done or what we haven't done that the Lord's told us to do, some, sometimes we just think, oh, the Lord's not really serious about that. He's not really paying attention. Or it won't really catch up to us. We, 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 we tend to think, well, I can just continue to violate God's word and it'll cost me nothing because after all, grace Oh, thank the Lord for his grace. Thank the Lord for his mercy. They were in this place where they thought, ah, oh, you know, we love the Lord. We're following the Lord, blah, 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 blah. But they weren't. And you know what? Even, even for us as New Testament believers who've received God's grace, God hasn't changed. And though we're not under the law, it's not as though he ignores us when we're sinning. Paul articulates this in Galatians chapter 6. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. God's, God's, it's not as though he's ignoring these things. And though your sin is covered, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your sin is covered, and you, you may not be going to hell because of it, there's still going to be consequences. God didn't stop loving the nation, but he was faithful to bring discipline to them. He wanted them to know, hey, you can't get away with this. And so I've been counting the years. You've ignored me. There should have been 70 of these years. I'm taking them. That's the length of captivity. God sometimes allows evil men to reign over his people in judgment. I mean, we see it over and over again. Here, he calls, he calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant. It's not as though he, he's, he's a, a, a follower of God or a believer in God, but God's going to use him for his own purpose. 
He called them to repentance. They ignored him. They refused to acknowledge sin and repent. And so God gave them over. Look at verse 2. It says, the Lord gave. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now, Jehoiakim was uh, one of the sons of Josiah. Who Josiah was a king who brought lots of reforms. He did some good things. But his sons were terrible. He was one of the last kings. He never really was fully king in that he was appointed by Pharaoh Necho. Egypt had taken over Israel at this time. And for the first two years, Jehoiakim was kind of a puppet king. He was king in the land, but he was under the rule of the Egyptians. In 2 Chronicles 36, 5, it tells us Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. There's his calling card. There's his resume. So many of these kings, that's, the, what, that's kind of all that's, and he did evil. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. So his first couple years were under uh, Pharaoh Necho, and then, and then the remainder was he, was, he was a puppet king. When Babylon came and took them captive. Is it any wonder that our nation has seemed to have lost its blessing? God's name is on our money. And God we trust, it says. The commandments are etched in the marble walls of the highest court in the land. Yet we've driven him out of the public square entirely. He's not welcome in our schools, at least not in any meaningful way, only symbolically. All of the politicians claim him. Very few actually follow him. The laws, the legislation, all these things that we do, that we allow, not... Maybe not us personally, but I'm just talking as a nation. The gross immorality that we've embraced. It's no wonder. It's no wonder our nation is such a mess. When we look at what happened to Israel, how, how is it that, that, that they could have this great seeming failure? Because they refused. For centuries, they refused to obey the Lord. The cause of captivity was sin. It always is, right? That's the, that's the cause of it. And it's true for the nation. It's true for an individual. If you persist in unrepented sin, you will find yourself captive. You'll be captive to the very sin that you commit. There's a cost. Look at, look at the cost of the nation. The prized possessions of the house of God. It says, not only did the Lord give over the king of Judah into his hand, along with some of, it's the vessels of the house of God. Initially, it seemed as though Nebuchadnezzar only took some of the precious items from the treasury, from the temple, these were the gold and silver vessels. We'll see in chapter 5. They'll be drinking out of them. They'll be partying with them. It's a great lesson when we get there. Jeremiah tells us that eventually they came back and they took everything, but initially it seems as though they took maybe just some of the smaller items. When faith becomes empty religion, God allows the house to be plundered. All over America, there's dead and dying churches. And it's a wonder. Our church movement, Calvary Chapel, is primarily what we focus on is expositional Bible teaching and church planting. That's what we do. 
as churches in our country have become dead and dying churches for, for any variety of reasons, we've been the beneficiary. It's been kind of interesting to watch. I mean, we're in a building that another group built. A, a group that initially built this, they, don't, they no longer exist. My friend Chad in Charlottesville their church, they, they were just handed a building. There was, there was a fellowship with a great facility, and they just over time died out. They, they, they died out through the course of not embracing and bringing in young people and raising them up, and so the congregation just aged out in religion. And so they called up and said, hey, we got a building. You want it? <laughs> Free. Here it is. The same thing happened to my buddy Andy in Ballard. He, you know, he, he was working on a church plant, and we were praying for him. We actually supported him in that for a little bit. And, and then he found out about this group in Ballard. In Ballard, downtown Seattle. This, it's like a wonderful, densely populated area. And they said, hey, we've got this building worth millions of dollars. You want it? There you go. It's free. <laughs> It's, it's crazy. We've been the beneficiary of that. It's a sad thing, however. But the Lord does it. He just, he has a way to just say, okay. He just gives this. He gave Jehoiakim king of Judah over. He gave the vessels of the house of God over. It might seem like a total failure. I mean, uh, it, it, it does. On some level, it seems like, what? We just sang these songs of victory, right? We, just, we sing these songs that have all these kind of military overtones. Because our, our God is victorious. We're proud of our victorious God. And it would seem as though, man, what's the deal? And, and you get from that psalm that I read, it's like, ah, how is it that we, the children of God, are seeing this great failure? How is it that the, the precious vessels from the temple where we worship God have been given over? Now they're in the idol's temple. It would seem like an embarrassment. But it's not as though God is impotent to guard and protect against these things. He absolutely is strong. He, he absolutely can protect against all of these things. This is his divine judgment. Giving it over. God hasn't failed. The people have failed. And of greater loss than the prized possessions, the prized youth, the prized people, now, if you're an older person, it's not like you're not prized. Right? Whenever you're thinking about youth, it's not like the youth are, are better or more important, but the youth are the future. Young people are the future. That's why we give place and emphasis to young people. We should. Not only were the prized possessions taken, the prized people were taken. Look at, look at what it says there in verse 3 and 4. Some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family, nobles, youths in whom was no defect. I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have been on the I wouldn't have been taken. <laughs> Good looking, yeah, I'm out. Showing intelligence, eh. endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, ability for serving. Took, they took the prime. They took the best of the best. They took the cream of the crop. Again, this, this isn't as though everyone else didn't have any value, but they took the best. They took the best of what would be the future for the nation. The story in these early chapters of Daniel focus on him and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They weren't the only ones taken captive. There were perhaps hundreds of young people taken captive. 
And, and none of the women are mentioned, but you know the precious daughters of Israel were also taken. They're not the, they're not the subject of these stories. There was a lot. This is the wealth of the nation that's been taken. The cost of captivity is great. The enemy always wants to take away the future. Right? He always is seeking to take away the future. And we have to look at this in two ways, right? There is a sense that this is, there is a strategy of the enemy. Our enemy is the devil. Here, he's personified in Nebuchadnezzar. God is allowing this for his own purpose and his own glory, yet there's a demonic strategy in the whole thing. And the strategy, as we look at it, as it exists in this story, as we're seeking to make application, the strategy is the same. Steal the kids. Steal the future. Own the future. That's the, that's the strategy of the master strategist. We should understand that lesson. Even while God is allowing this, the taking away of an entire generation, nevertheless, he's going to be glorified in it. And that's the, and that's the wonderful, right? That's the wonderful thing about all of these stories. So the cost is all the precious things. And then we see this control. The control of captivity, the, the, the plan of how, of how here Nebuchadnezzar or Babylon, how they're going to just control everything. And they have a fourfold strategy. He has a, a fourfold strategy. And as we look at it, again, there is, this is what the story says. And then as we look at our world, it's the same strategy. These same things are happening. Pay attention. Because all of these things are employed in our culture today and for the same purpose. These are the four strategies of control. Number one is isolation. They're taken out of their community and their heritage. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail. The second one is indoctrination. They are educated in the pagan culture and the dark arts. The third is compromised. Compromised. They are enticed by pleasures to indulge in what is lawfully forbidden. And then confusion. And the confusion is, is in regard to their own identity. Their own identity has changed. The isolation, what we've, what we've seen, they've been removed. They've been removed from everything they know. They, they've been removed from their community, immersed now in the Babylonian culture. They've been stripped from their homeland, their family, literally all that they have ever known. Taken out of that environment, now in this new environment. In Babylon, they were separated from the regular, rhythmic, public worship of God that was part of their culture. No longer exposed to the teaching of God's word and, and from the daily life of living in community, the community of believers in God. Taken out of the family of God. Does that sound familiar? Isolation. Hello, 2020. Live in isolation. It's unsafe to be together. It's unsafe to gather. It's un unsafe to worship. Unsafe to sing. Second, we see that there is a plan for indoctrination. Clearly, Nebuchadnezzar gives orders, right, to control what these young men are taught. He ordered him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Now, now the Chaldeans, they're mentioned here. They're going to be mentioned all through this book. There's, there's the, the larger group of Babylon, but in the 
in the population of Babylon, there were these Chaldeans. They were a powerful ethnic group within the larger population. Sometimes the entire population is given just that name. They're, they're just, you know, generalized as, as Chaldeans. But then there's also a specific group of individuals that are called Chaldeans as well. Look at chapter 2, verse 2. It says, The king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dream. So you see in that list, these are people evidently who, who are, are like the magicians, conjurers, and sorcerers. They, they have some, some knowledge of we would, what we would call the dark arts. Demonic things even. Similarly in Daniel 4, we read, Then the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners came in and related the dream to him. These people, the Chaldeans, were known as astrologers or mediums. We might call them fortune tellers. This was the culture. This is who they were. And so this is what he wants them to be instructed in. He wants to take these Hebrew youth and instruct them in all of their knowledge. Now I'm sure in the education principles, in the things that they were teaching them, there were probably some good things. But the overall thing was this demonic, dark, mystical teaching. It's interesting that the, the course of the education was three years. Now, if you're older, high school was three years. Right now, I think nowadays they made it four. Or, you know, there's all kinds of different ways. But I think earlier it used to just be, you know, sophomore, junior, and freshman year. The parallel to our public education system shouldn't be missed. And I'm not opposed. I'm not opposed to public education. I support good people in the public education system. We, we have teachers that go to church here or have gone to church here. We have many students that are in the public education system. But don't be fooled. Don't be fooled in the areas of science and literature and social studies and humanities. They don't, they don't teach the things that we believe in. They teach the opposite. The foundation, the foundation of what's taught in our educational system is probably more like the Babylonians than anything remotely biblical or Christian. Right? You guys get that, right? We send our young people to this system of education and then off to four years of higher education that's mixed in with absolute hedonism. And then we wonder. And then we wonder why our culture is in moral decline. For decades, I've seen it over and over again. Young people raised in the faith, sent off to college, never to be seen again. Not in, not in church. School is a place where people go to lose their faith. That's just, that's just reality. School is a place where faith goes to die. Now you might just think, man, Pastor Jim, you're a bummer. That, you just, trashed, you just trashed, my, trashed my future or my kid's future. I'm headed off to college and you just basically likened it to demonic teachings. There's a guy that I like to listen to. My wife and I uh, like this artist. He's not a Christian guy, but his name is Brett Denon. He's a real quirky, odd fellow, but he's got this song called uh, When We Were Young, and he's got this line. He says, high school was a catastrophe. It was a failure factory. <laughs> I remember hearing that thinking, amen to that. It's like, that's what it was. That was what it was for me. It's what it is for a lot of people. It doesn't have to be, though. It doesn't have to be. If we keep in mind the story, these guys did well, even in that environment. They did well. Keep in mind, there were probably hundreds. There were probably hundreds of Hebrew youth 
brought into this culture. Only four are mentioned. I don't want to make a big deal of that because you can't really make too much out of the fact that the scripture is silent, but only four are mentioned. I wonder what happened to all the others. The odds aren't good living in captivity. There's isolation, indoctrination. The third area of control was one that created compromise. It was designed to create compromise. So not only did they seek to control education, they also sought to manipulate these young people with pleasures. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank. I get the feeling this was probably better than school lunch. <laughs> Although I liked school lunch. At Linwood High, man, we, we had good school lunch. I, I loved hamburger gravy on mashed potatoes, pizza, tacos, the beef eater sandwich. I, they had some good food. Eventually, I think they brought in the salad bars. But, man, back in the day, we had some good carbs. So no wonder after lunch, everyone wanted to fall asleep. <laughs> the, the control over the diet was intended to lead them to compromise. Many of the delicacies they were offered were forbidden foods, according to the Levitical law. According to the way that they were raised, many of these foods probably were, were off limits. But oh so good. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if Nebuchadnezzar brought out King Crab, but that would be, <laughs> that would cause failure for me. <laughs> the control over the diet was not just to keep them healthy, but, but it was a cause to, to, to compromise, and it was a cause to, it was a thing that spoiled them. They'd never eaten like this before. Some of the things that they ate. And, and, and there's a, some idea probably that this was a tactic of control. If we give you the finest things, we can also take them away. They're being spoiled. Homer wrote about a mythological people called the lotus eaters. Are you guys familiar with that term? The lotus eaters. They were island dwellers who sat around and ate flowers that were narcotic. And once they ate the delicacies of this lotus, they would forget their home and never desire to return. Rich living, rich living is an enticement that all too easily masters the senses and blunts the otherwise sharp edge of Christian commitment and even the strongest of individuals. One commentary that I read from a guy named Sinclair Ferguson, he had this to say. He said, somebody in Nebuchadnezzar's palace knew enough about the human heart to see that most men have their price and good times, comfort, self-esteem, and, and a position in society are usually sufficient bid for a soul. Jesus said, what does it take? Or what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? He wanted them to compromise. Nebuchadnezzar thought, mm, I'll get these guys. I'll win them over. We'll give them the best. We'll give them the best food. They won't be able to resist it. Next week, we'll see how these four withstood those enticements. They did withstand them, and, and so they're great models, and they're great examples to us. They withstood the compromise that was offered them. Fourthly, we see the strategy of confusion. And this is something that we're seeing today. We're seeing great confusion, and, and the confusion is, is like this. The confusion has to do with identity. says that the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. To Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And Azariah, Abednego. 
I remember one of my early trips to Mexico, you know, um, wrestling with language is always part of, you know, anytime you go to a foreign land and, and I remember sitting around with some young people and we're all just trying to get to know one another's names. And, you know, so what's your name? Jim. Well, Yim? No, Jim. Yim. No, Jim. And it was, it was kind of frustrating. It was like, well, they, they can't say J's the way we do. They say it differently. And it was, you know, for a young guy, it was like this thing was like, you know, you know. and so they would call me other things. No, not like that. But they, they called me Jaime. Jaime. It's like, okay, so whatever, that's the, what, I, it kind of bothered me at first, because it's like, well, that's not, my name is Jim, in any language, it's the same, my name isn't changing. You know, after a while, you know, you get used to these things, and you understand it. I, I, I remember discovering that James was Santiago, which, Santiago, I didn't mind that at all, that was cool. <laughs> But, but Jaime just didn't sound really cool, or Jaimelito, or Gordito. So you can call me any of those things, just don't call me late for tacos. Um, our names mean something, right? They're, they're part of our identity. The commander renamed these Hebrew young men. And their name was an important part of their identity. It was who they were. Can you imagine you're, you're 15 or 16 years old, which we don't know. These guys were, it's assumed that they were in their teens. You're 15 or 16 years old and the government says, we're changing your name. How to be weird. But, but not only are they declaring that they're changing your name, but then everyone practically is starting to call you by the new name. It's weird. It would, it would really mess with your head. You're not, who, you're not who you've been called all your life. You're not, you're not who your parents called you. We've given you a new name. And it's significant. As we go through the list, Daniel, Daniel's name had a meaning. And it meant, God is my judge. Not any God. The Hebrew God. The God of his fathers. This God is my judge. That's my name. It, it meant something. And they changed it to, may Bel protect his life. Belteshazzar, may Bel protect his life. Bel is synonymous with Marduk, the chief god of the pantheon of gods that the Babylonians worshipped. It was significant, this little change. Hananiah's name, meant Yah has been gracious, Yah, Yahweh. Again, there's a specific God in mind there, the God of the Hebrews. God has been gracious. And so they changed it to Shadrach, which means the command of Aku. Some of these things, it's not well known I mean, some, I mean, we're talking about a long time ago, and they don't know everything about the Babylonian culture, but it's thought that this was a perversion of Marduk, again, their primary god. Mishael, his name meant, who is what God is? I love that one. It's, it's, like, it's like a proud name. Who is what God is? Again, a specific, the God, the God. And they changed it to who is what Aku is. Azariah, his name was Yah has helped. Again, all of these names, they mean something. They're tied to their God. And for each one of them, they're changed to imply uh, an entirely different meaning. Uh, Abednego means servant of Nebo, son of the Babylonian god Bel. As humans, your identity, it's not necessarily your name, right? It's not so much who you are or what you do. Really, our identity is whose we are. 
That's where the confusion is. And, and in each one of these names, it signified a significant change. Their, their names were identified, each one, they were identified with God, with God's people. We belong to God. As Christians, we certainly should understand this. We belong to God, not just any God, but the God, the only God, the God who created us. This is why, this is why, this is the root of why there is so much confusion today. In our day, there is this same confusion in regard to identity. And, and it's, it's this question, who made you? Who made you? To whom do you belong? I remember growing up hearing the culture ask these important questions. Like many of you, I listened to a lot of music. And so that was the way I took in culture. What is the culture saying? What the culture is saying is always expressed in the music of the day. I'm sure I'll stumble some of you, but I remember that song from The Who. Uh, repeating over and over and over again that line, Who are you? Who are you? We'll just ignore the expletive in that song, which was so groundbreaking that made it so cool, you know. But who are you? It's an important question. One of my favorite groups was the, the band Supertramp. And in their song, logical song, they, they, there's this cry. It's so hauntingly beautiful where they, they're singing, please tell me who I am. It's like, it's, sometimes you just wonder, what was the artist thinking when they wrote this? What an incredible, this is the cry of the human heart. Please tell me who I am. Why? Because it's important. Nebuchadnezzar sought to erase this, the very identity. And so changing their names sows confusion. There's so much confusion in our world, and it's about identity. Because we, we as a culture, we've taken on the identity of Babylon. Through all these same things, through isolation, through indoctrination, through compromise... And we wonder, why are our kids so confused about their own identity? Wherever the wall has been breached, that's where the repair has to go on. Like, if you look at these things, it's like from the, the, at least the four points of the outline, it's like we have to start with that one. That's the, that's the thing that must be repaired. Who are we? We have to reclaim our identity. Because everything comes from that. We've forgotten who we are because we've forgotten whose we are. And, and it's this teaching. It's, it comes right out of the book, right from the very beginning. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That's it. Once you remove that, everything's a mess. We've got to remember that. We belong to God. He's the one that's created us. He's created us unique. He's created us to be like Him. He created us male and female. That's our identity. That's who we are. And then He tells us over and over, not just that He created us, but that He knows us. The prophet said this, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. There, obviously, he's talking about an individual, maybe even reference to the nation. But God's saying, before you were born, I knew you. Like, just, just think about that for a minute. Just as an individual, before you were ever born, God knew all about you. That's your identity. That's who you are. Flaws and all, all your warts, all the weirdness of who you are as an individual, all my weirdness, all my, God knew it all. And he said, I, 
I knew you. I actually even have a purpose for you. I've consecrated you for a particular purpose. That's my identity. Made by God, called by God, loved by God. God has you in mind. He hasn't forgotten you. And even even for the nation, even in the midst of this great trial that they're in, God's got a purpose with it. I'm sure at some point, the nation, you know, at large, they probably is like, what is going on? What a failure. And you might be thinking even of the Christian church and, and, and uh, of believers today. It's like, what a, how, how did we lose everything? How is it that Babylon has become so powerful and we've become so weak? Well, again, because of sin, because of the fallen nature of the world. There is a course that, that, that we are on. And yet, even in that, God's got a plan and a purpose. Look at what the prophet said. So much of this is interaction between we're looking at the book of Daniel, but then what did Jeremiah say? Thus says the Lord, Jeremiah 29, 10 and 11, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. A lot of times we, we read verse 11 without the context of verse 10. This has to do with the nation. It has to do with the nation that's going into captivity, that's, that's, that's going through discipline. And God says, you're going to be in captivity for 70 years. It's going to suck. It needs to happen. But my plan is to bring you out of that. I haven't forgotten you. And I'm going to fulfill my word. There's a promise. I'm going to fulfill my word. My plan is for welfare, not for calamity. You've got a future. You've got a hope. That's the identity that we have. Even now, even today. The discipline, the time of discipline was absolutely necessary. It wasn't pleasant, but it was necessary. But even in captivity, God didn't forget his people. And the ones that didn't forget him, these four, the ones that didn't forget him, the ones that held on to him in faith, he blessed them. He blessed them. Actually, they prospered. I mean, that's the story of Joseph as well. We see these things kind of repeat over and over again. For the the man and the woman who holds on to God in the midst of this difficult season, God blesses them. God prospers them. We're reading about these four. We're not reading about any of the others. We're reading about and celebrating. They are celebrated in scriptures. Why? Because they held on. Because they resisted. And they held on to God in the midst of all of these tactics of the enemy. They held on by faith. And they found God to be faithful to them as they did so. And that's the the lesson. We'll look at this as we look at it, the rest of the story next week. But we're going to see them become bright, shining examples of how to live life in Babylon. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? By not forgetting him. By not forgetting our identity. Even when it seems like total failure. Even when it seems like the enemy is so strong. Yet for those who hold on to him. There's blessing. And the songs can be sung. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for uh, our identity in you. God, we've been created in your image. You love us. You know us. You have a plan for our lives. Every one of us. Every individual. And God, whether whether we're doing well today, whether we find ourselves somewhat distanced from you in the throes of sin, in the throes of captivity, Lord, give us repentant hearts. Help us to resist the pull, the call of the world, the temptation of compromise, 
the indoctrination of the world. Lord, help us to reject these things, to hold on to you, to hold on to our identity. We are the children of God, the beloved. Remind us of that today, tomorrow. Pray these things in Jesus' name.